Welcome to Chapter 15, Thinking About Inference. In this chapter, we're going to talk about conditions for inference in practice, how confidence intervals behave, how significance tests behave, planning studies, that is, we're going to determine the sample size for confidence intervals when someone tells us they want a particular confidence level or a particular margin of error that they would like. Then we'll learn about type 1 and type 2 errors. These are errors that are involved in hypothesis testing or significance tests. Well, in Chapter 14, we learned the Z procedures. If we know the standard deviation of the population and the population is normally distributed, and we attain our samples from simple random samples, our confidence interval for the mean is obtained by the following formula. We take that sample mean of sample of size n, we add and subtract from that a value. This value is called the margin of error. And that margin of error is just the critical value, that's z alpha over 2, times sigma over the square root of n where sigma over the square root of n is the standard deviation of our sampling distribution of samples of size n. So you have your margin of error is your z alpha over 2 times sigma divided by the square root of n. Now our critical value depends on our confidence level. So we'll go through a few examples just as a reminder of what we did in chapter 14, but this is how we would obtain a confidence interval with the giving conditions that were stated above. Now, if we want to test a hypothesis, so our null hypothesis would be mu equal a certain value that we denote by mu naught, we use a one sample z statistic. Now, this test statistic is just how many standard deviations our sample mean is in the null hypothesis distribution. So you have to remember how to determine what the null hypothesis distribution is. And how we do that is, we already know what the mean of it is, it's mu naught, and the standard error, which would be sigma divided by the square root of n, the size of our, um, n being the size of our sample, our simple random sample. And so this is how we would find out how many standard deviations x bar our sample mean is in the null hypothesis distribution, and that's our test statistic. Now they're called z procedures because both involve a one sample z statistic, and they use the standard normal table, the standard normal distribution, which is table A in our book. Now, when we talk about conditions for inference in practice, only under very specific conditions can confidence intervals or significance tests be trusted. You must understand the conditions that must be met, and you must judge whether you can fit your specific problem so that you can use these techniques. Inference is the most reliable when the data comes from a simple random sample or a randomized comparative experiment. Random samples use chance to choose who the respondents are. Random, randomized comparative experiments use chance to assign subjects to different treatments. The deliberate use of this chance ensures the laws of probability that they'll apply to the outcomes, and this ensures that the statistical inference makes sense. Conditions for inference in practice. The data must be a simple random sample from the population. So you really need to ask if you should read in the newspaper, read in a journal, anything, where did the data come from? Different methods are needed for different designs. And you have to make sure the methods that you use are valid methods and that there aren't any problems involved in how you collect your data. The Z procedures are not correct for samples other than simple random samples. So if you don't obtain your data from a simple random sample, you can't use the Z procedures. Well, you can. You can get an answer, but it won't be reliable. Now, outliers can distort the results. The sample mean, as you remember, is strongly influenced by outliers. So when you have outliers far to the right, it's going to pull your mean to be greater. So these outliers strongly influence the mean. So you always have to explore your data be before you perform an analysis. And this is what I was talking about. The shape of the population is very important. It does matter. You need to look at it. 
Skewness and outliers make the Z procedures untrustworthy unless the sample is large. So you need to be able to have repeatability, reliability. So if there is skewness and outliers, you have to have a large sample. In practice, the Z procedures are reasonably accurate for any sample of at least a moderate size from a fairly symmetric distribution. And remember also in this um, in chapter 14 is that the population standard deviation must be known. Now that's very rare for that to happen. Now chapter 17 will introduce procedures for when sigma is unknown, a more realistic situation. So let's look at where did the data come from, the question that you should ask whenever you read any type of statistics in the newspaper or journal or papers. When you use statistical inference, you're act acting as if your data are a probability sample or come from a randomized experiment. Statistical conference intervals and tests cannot remedy basic flaws in producing data, such as you have voluntary response samples or uncontrolled experiments. And also if you have bias in your sample, any of these can create quite a bit of trouble. Also be aware of the non-response or dropouts in a well-designed study. They could be very important pieces of the puzzle. Now, if our data doesn't come from a probability sample, that means a simple random sample or a randomized experiment, our conclusions that we get or your conclusions that you would get will be open to challenge. So to answer the challenge, you have to ask whether the, da the data can be trusted as a basis for the conclusion of the study. So we're going to look at this one example, memory artery ligation. What happened here, surgeons tested a procedure to alleviate pain caused by inadequate, in, <laughs> inadequate blood supply to the heart. And the patients reported a statistically significant reduction in angina pain. But the design of the experiment was flawed. It wasn't controlled. So that made, our con that made the conclusions for this unreliable. Now statistical significance indicates that something other than chance is at work but it doesn't say what that something is. Since this experiment was not controlled, the reduction in pain could be due to the placebo effect. Now in a controlled experiment that they did, it did show that this was the case and surgeons immediately stopped performing the operation. So let's look at problems 15.1 and 15.3 on page 397. So if you would please turn your books to 397 and we're going to look at problem 15.1. Rate the movie. <clears throat> a professor interested in the op opinions of college age adults and a new hit movie asked 25 students in her course on a documentary filmmaking to rate the entertainment value of the movie on a scale from 0 to 5. Which of the following is the most important reason why a confidence interval to the mean rating by all college-aged adults based on the data is of little use. And then we'll move on to 15.3. Um, a marketing consultant observes 50 consecutive shoppers at a supermarket re recording how much each shopper spends in the store. Suggest some reasons why it may be risky to act as if 50 consecutive shoppers at a particular time are at a simple random sample of shoppers at this store. And what do you think the answer to that is? So now we're going to um, stop here. And in the next installment, we'll we will continue on.